Welcome back, Growth Nation. This is Dave Rogamosi, your host of Scale or Die. And this is the show where we uncover proven growth strategies from CEOs and growth experts behind some of the world's fastest growing startups. And today, we've got Mr. Conversion Optimization himself, in my mind at least, Pep Laya. And Pep has been kind of, in, in my mind, the guy that all companies are going to to learn conversion optimization. He's been an advocate, he's been beating that drum, and I have personally learned a ton from him, and I know a ton of other big startups that you guys all follow, uh, either you know, have worked with his agency as it started off, or are working with the Institute and learning you know, through the online platforms and live trainings. And so, Pep, I'm excited to dig in and talk about conversion optimization specifically for startups. Welcome to the show. Thank you, thanks for having me. So you talk about this stuff all the time, I feel. All like. the time. This is your thing. It is. So how did you get into conversion optimization? And I guess like why? Because I don't see mm. a ton of people like championing this, talking about this, but you do. So I guess how did that start and why? I, I mean, more than 12 years ago, I was doing SEO and PPC. And in like 2007, it wasn't too hard to get sites ranking like number one on Google. So when I did that for my clients, I saw, okay, they, they're getting a bunch more traffic, but not necessarily making more money. So I realized, oh, there's, there's a piece missing here. So traffic is not the be all end all. And then I stumbled upon conversion optimization. There were very few people doing it back then. It was mostly uncharted territory. Uh, but I was you know, lucky with finding some mentors along the way and a lot of trial and error, um, most errors. <laughs> yeah. And then, then, yeah, since 2011, I've been doing it full time, started CXL. Why do you think why is conversion optimization not as sexy as like traffic or the funnels or, you know, I feel like there's so many more people talking about that than hmm. the process, the tough process behind getting a 10% lift. Beats me, man. I think it's fascinating. I mean, also like if you, if you tell the concept, hey, so like we could just improve this metric and you'll make a bunch more money, you know, like improve your conversion rate uh, by, you know, 20% and it's it's equal it's the same as like tripling your traffic you know so it's I don't know why more why it's not mainstream beats me man yeah yeah okay very cool well, I want to dive in and ask about you know your process and how you know you teach people and mm -hmm. how you guys implement it yourself but I guess before that like what are the big mistakes like when you're working with a company or you talk to somebody and they mm -hmm. you know say hey here's what we're doing like what are the big mistakes you see people making yeah 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 First things that pop to my mind is thinking that shiny new toys are selling well. So things like uh, a couple of years ago, every single e-commerce store, even today, they had to have those automated, uh, automatic sliders. Like every three seconds, there's a new image. Oh, that's cool. That's fancy. Executives like it. We need some of that. Kills conversions like nothing else. Or now every cool startup has to have a video background. I mean, sure, it looks cool. It's sell no, it's it's distracting. So 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 getting um, you know liking chasing those those new trends, or ghost buttons, and all these design trends, that that's a mistake. Um, what else? Uh, I mean, trying to sound too clever, uh, either by uh, inserting a lot of jargon into your messaging. Uh, very common among B two B startups trying to sound fancy and smart, and, you know, now with more AI and uh, like, but a, when a human being is reading that value proposition, they're not actually getting it. And clarity trumps persuasion any day. So just if they come to the site, do they quickly know what the heck it is that you're selling and talking about? Exactly right. So, you know, if you're, if you're a well-known brand, if you're like Amazon or Salesforce, I mean, you can, you can get away with it because people know you and trust you. But if you're a small startup, you're facing an uphill trust battle as it is. People haven't heard of you. And then uh, also like clarity, like what, what is it that you guys do? How can you help me? But if you go down the jargon route, which is very attractive to do, and also that's the first sign of a rookie copywriter. They, they don't write to, um, you know, like if you want to be better than you are, you just default to jargon. I don't know why that is, but yeah. Yeah. Have you seen or done any tests on whether adding the word AI or machine learning actually does increase anything anywhere? Uh, I, I, I personally have not, but I saw um, the guys at ProfitWell, they did a study where, a uh, pricing study where they saw that people, when it's 
something which now with AI, they're ready to pay like a premium price for it, like 30% uh, more or something. Interesting. So and yeah. You, do you think that's true? Uh, I mean, executives, again, they like shiny new toys, you know, now with more blockchain and AI, you mm -hmm. know, it's like add 50% to average order value. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very cool. All right, maybe I'll try that out. Um, so let's talk about just like the process. Mm -hmm. We can go super deep if you want. We can kind mm -hmm. of skim over the, the bullet points at the top. But when you're thinking about teaching this or working with a new startup, what is the process? Right. So people have three or so faulty assumptions. Like first of all, they think CRO is a list of tactics that maybe you can copy from a website. You know, there are plenty of blog posts around. With, 99, you know, 99. Proven strategies. That always work, and et cetera. I think I've probably put some of those out there. I should probably, <laughs> I should probably take those down. Yeah, I mean, people <laughs> want to believe it's true, and so they tend to you know, get a lot of backlinks and you know, people, social shares and so on. But it's not the truth, you know, because, um, so what, let's say you, have, you find a list of 99 tactics. So what do you do with that list? Do you, uh, implement them all at once on your website? I mean, no, I mean, your website would look crazy. Uh, it's like Ling's cars, like, look that website up, you know, that's, that's like 99 tactics implemented all at once. Uh, so, okay, we can't do that. There's also like, if we implement 99 tactics at once, some will work, some will not work, and they'll, they cancel each other out, and they, you know, like, you don't know which one of these 99 works, so we can't do that. So, okay, can we test them one by one and see which one will work? This is another huge mistake companies make. They think that A-B testing, well, they don't know statistics, A-B testing statistics, and they think running a test is like, oh, seven versus, you know, 10 conversions, and now we know, far from the truth. So on an average website with average traffic, you know, on average A-B test should run like four weeks. So testing uh, like 100 ideas one by one takes like seven and a half years. Yeah. So you can't do that. That's like nobody has that kind of time. So and also, okay, let's start testing them. But like, what do we test first, second, and so on? How do you prioritize random ideas off a blog post? Like you can't. There's no way of doing it. So instead, what you need to do is you need to understand what are the actual problems your very specific website has. And you can the only way to do that is through research. So you need to conduct qualitative and quantitative research to understand what are the particular problems your website has and what are you, your very specific users, uh, which issues they are having with your website. And uh, you know, how you go about it, um, well, there are multiple ways. So or like, I'll walk you uh, through a process that works phenomenally well. And I mean, with user research, you can go crazy in depth, you know, deep, but that also means it costs a lot of money, costs a lot of time. So you need really need to weigh your, uh, uh, you know, do a cost benefit analysis here. And of course, the bigger you are in terms of your transaction volume, the bigger the impact of like uh, any improvements, um, you know, the bigger the impact. So, so for instance, if I increase your sales by one percent, if your annual revenue is hundred thousand, that's like what thousand bucks, not very much. Yep. Whereas if my revenue is 100 million, 1% is a million bucks. It's worth, worth investing in, in research. So there's this research Excel framework that I came up with a number of years ago, which is this, let's say, distilled down uh, uh, user research, like MV, minimum viable research process, essentially, that doesn't take a lot of time or money and gives you great ideas. Um, so step one is you want to look into any technical issues that your site has. Because odds are your front, front end developers did not do their QA right. Nobody wants to do QA. It's boring, it's terrible, time consuming. And they probably all have like big ass, uh, you know, 50 inch monitors and they, uh, they're on their uh, MacBooks and they never looked at the website on a, you know, a 13 inch Dell or something. Or the one that always gets us is mobile. Oh you know, yes. It's like, we launch something, we think it's amazing. Four days later, someone's at home going to bed and they pull it up on their phone. They're like, oh my gosh, it doesn't yeah. even fit on the screen. Absolutely. So, I mean, the best way is that you have real time, uh, uh, basically QA reporting. 
So if a conversion rate on a particular device or segment tanks, like fluctuates more than 20% uh, below average, you get a notification somebody can go and check it because no human can really do this fast enough. How would you set that up? Uh, Google Alerts, Google Analytics Alerts, they're really slow though. They're like 24 hours, you maybe already lost a bunch of money. But manually what you should do, you know, go into your web analytics app. Mostly, most people use Google Analytics. And you look at the conversion rate per browser version, per device uh, category, uh, or, or even a particular device. And you, you want to compare, you know, let's say there are iPhone X converts at, you know, 5%, whereas uh, your latest Samsung converts at 3%. Like, why is that? Uh, well, I mean, some of it might be um, due to non-technical factors. So, for instance, people using, uh, let's say, Safari browsers versus Internet Explorer might be a thing that people using Internet Explorer have old computers, ergo, they don't have much money, and hence they're not spending as much, and they convert at oh. a lower rate, whereas iPhone people likely younger, richer, and so on. Yep. But like if if uh, you compare your conversion rate, uh, latest Chrome versus Chrome two versions ago, and there's like a 30% conversion rate difference there, it's likely because of bugs. So you want to take care of all that stuff. Step one. How often do you see companies like solving big problems there? Well, when we come on, that's the first thing. On, on their own, hardly ever. You know, they, they're focused on like, you know, CTA copy or, you yeah. know, uh, how big is the button and silly things like that. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, over the course of like last seven years, my agency has probably, you know, made companies 100 million bucks just by detecting bugs. Huh. You know, like Interesting. stuff doesn't work on a particular browser device combination. So yeah. that's step one. Yeah. Step two is like you want to conduct a walkthrough of your website page by page, desktop, mobile separately. And this, this is best done in, as a group exercise. And you start assessing each page on your website against a certain set uh, criteria, like clarity. Do I understand exactly where I am, what I'm supposed to do on this page, what to do next? If I'm not super clear, like what can be done, like what's vague, anything vague, we have to, uh, like, uh, I like to take like uh, screenshots and put like annotations on screenshots. This is too vague, this is too vague. Mm -hmm. Need to enhance clarity here. Uh, then we want to assess friction. So every page on the website should be designed to uh, get the user to take one particular action. You know, if, if they're on your home page, Usually the action is get them off the home page, you know, click somewhere, uh, maybe self-segment. Uh, I'm a solo user, I'm a big enterprise, well, you know, whatever it is. Uh, then maybe we want them to go to the, or take a product tour, go to the feature space. On the feature space we say, hey, look at the pricing. On the pricing page we say, go to checkout, so on. So what is holding back, what is stopping people from taking action? What is, what is causing friction? You know, write that down, all the ideas that we have. Um, and then what are we doing to increase user motivation to take that action that we want them to take? Maybe it's to increase social proof, maybe it's to uh, increase, um, you know, uh, list more benefits, what's in it for them, these kind of things. It's so frequent where people actually forget to list, you know, what's in it for the user. They're all about we, we, we. Uh, in the industry, we call it uh, we, weeing all over yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, and so you again, take note of all the things. What else could we do to increase their motivation? Because <clears throat> if, you, if you think about conversion optimization or like getting people to take action, you, you only have two levers. One is increasing their motivation and they might come in with some sort of intrinsic motivation uh, if they're like inbound traffic. Uh, but like you can increase that motivation. And then the other lever you have is decreasing friction. So for instance, if on, a, on my website is you need to fill out a form. The more form fields there are, the more friction, right? But if my motivation is sky high, I don't care. If, if you're gonna give me a brand new Ferrari, if I fill out your form with 80 form fields, I'm gonna do it because yeah. I want the free Ferrari. Like the friction doesn't matter. And of course, what you sell is not a free Ferrari. You know, you sell something else, so you can't have that much friction. Mm -hmm. Uh, you might want to have some friction to filter out, you know, tire kickers, people who are going to waste uh, your salespeople's time if you do demos and you know, things like that. 
Um, and, and, and so all these things that you write down about how could we improve our pages, this is not, of course, the truth. These are um, assumptions or uh, ideas of what, why our website might or might not be working as well. Now the next phase is qualitative, quantitative research to figure out whether those um, observations about our website, whether they're actually valid or invalid. And for, for qualitative, I want to do probably three things that are really easy to do. One is user testing. So usertesting.com or many of its, uh, its many uh, cheaper, way cheaper competitors, because usertesting.com is now pretty expensive. I think I've used Browser Stack before. I guess is that more like technically? Oh, Browser Stack, what, well, like that's QA. More QA. So it's not actual the users. User testing is actually sending it to users. So exactly, it's recruiting people who represent your target audience. They might not be perfect uh, uh, people, uh, but like they're actual human beings. And if they can read and you have words, words on your website, it's already pretty good. There's one I've used that like shows people for like five or 10 seconds and they have to like type out what that was. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, five the second five second test, test okay. usability hub, also good. Not as insightful as user testing. Uh, I think we're using Validly, Validately as the tool right now. It's, okay. It's exactly like usertesting.com, just much cheaper. Yeah. Uh, so basically, you want to recruit like 10 or so people and have them perform certain tasks. Uh, you want to ask them about, hey, what do you think this website is about? You know, checking your clarity. Mm -hmm. And then you want to say, uh, you know, if it's SaaS, it's like, hey, uh, you know, find out how much it costs. Because you want to see how long it takes for somebody to figure it out, especially if you have complicated pricing. Might be super easy, you know, like, but like depends on your site. Yeah. So never ask for their opinions. Like, hey, would you would you sign up? Would you pay for it? You know, things like that. Because these people are not risking with their own money. Uh, so user testing, super inside. You'll find all the sources of friction, confusion, uh, things like that. We had an event at our office recently. It was just a user. It's called User Test Fest, and everybody came to our office, and we were just testing our app, and we had them like set up a new campaign. And I mean, it is so insightful. Like even four people in, we knew like all the problems. And then the rest yeah. of the night, it was just everybody repeating the same exact thing. And it exactly, was just like right. unbelievably yeah, 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 insightful yeah, yeah. to do that. And uh, we, sk we skipped it for years, you know? And it's like, I think pe most people aren't doing that stuff. It's so fast and cheap to do, yeah. Second thing we do is, you know, on Google Analytics or whatever you use for your funnel uh, measurement, Kissmetrics, Mixpanel, doesn't matter. You, you, you see where people are dropping off. You know, maybe we have, you know, let's say, thousand people on our features page, only a hundred go to pricing and two guys buy. So it's like, okay, so we have like this significant drop offs in our, in our uh, uh, flow here. So what is holding them back on this pricing page? Like a hundred people go, two people sign up, 2%, well not, not too terrible, but people who make it, well, I mean, not too terrible for uh, overall site conversion rate, terrible for the pricing page. Because people who finally make it uh, to your pricing page, they should convert at like I don't know, 70 to 90 percent. Uh, all depends, of course, you know what they know and so on. But so, okay, you know, what do you do? How do you improve your pricing page? M massive drop off. Well, we can hypothesize all day long, and some of those ideas are probably pretty good. Uh, but again, we don't know which ones. So, the easy way to do is you put a poll on the website using maybe Hotjar or one of those tools, Qualaru, uh, asking, hey, what's holding you back from signing up right now. And sure, you know, you don't get a high response rate. You maybe get 2%, 4% response rate. Uh, so depending on your traffic, you know, it might take a while for you to get enough answers in. But I typically want to get like 200, 250 responses in, and then people will tell you right away what's, what's holding them back. Are you putting that like on the pricing page, on the order form? On, kind of on the page where the drop off happens. Yeah. And you maybe trigger it after you look, how, what's the average number of uh, seconds people spend on that page? So like maybe they spend 10 seconds on the page. So you want to trigger that when they've shown above average engagement. So you filter out instant bounces and you know, irrelevant people, and then you pop the question. And uh, you know, you, you'll learn things that you never thought about. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I remember working with this e-commerce site where massive drop off on their cart page. And like we're looking at this page, like looks perfectly legit to us. And then uh, put a poll there, and like almost everybody, like 80% said, oh, it's the high shipping costs. 
Whereas, like, if you look at the page, you don't think about high no. shipping costs. Oh, yeah, high shipping costs, so need to solve that problem. And the final third thing to do is you survey people who just completed the sign up. They signed up for a free trial or a paid plan, whatever it is. You, you survey them and you ask about their friction. You're like, what kind of doubts and hesitations you had before signing up? What, what, you know, what's almost stopped you from completing the sign up? Uh, any questions you had you couldn't find answers to? Things like that. While they still freshly remember their sign up experience. Super insightful. And you also want to know something about themselves. Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, are they small business, big business, depending on who you're targeting, you know, like are they male, female? Those, those can be like uh, multiple choice type of questions because you might want to segment the answers based on certain, uh, you know, criteria. But all the other questions have to be open-ended, no multiple choice. Because with multiple choice, you assume you know what the possible reasons are and you're shutting yourself completely off to what you don't know that you don't know. You guys never would have asked about the high shipping cost if you had yeah, like never four answers. Exactly, never crossed our mind. And, and you learn all kinds of things, like where people have all kinds of weird uh, you know, fears. Because you are so in, in your business, you forget what kind of hesitations uh, uh, people have. Also useful questions, a question to ask is, how many other sites did you check out before signing up with us? You know, let's say that you're selling invoicing software. Everybody and their mother are selling invoicing software, right? There's so many options mm -hmm. out there. Are they really comparing only signing up with you or not at all? Yep. No, they're checking out everybody. And often you, you learn that these guys did 30 days of research. They did demos with like eight software. Mm -hmm. And then you want to know which ones are they comparing you to, you know. Of course, you know your competitors. You can go to G2 Crowd and just look them all up. But like sometimes like there are competitors you didn't know that people compare you uh, against. And then does your website articulate clearly why it choose you over all those guys. And of course, do you have competitor comparison pages when they're searching for use proof versus, you know, use the other proof.com. Uh, and then you want to make your case, right? Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a case, well, you have a, you have a huge business problem. Not, this is not a conversion optimization problem no. anymore. Like if you don't have a competitive advantage or you can't clearly articulate your benefit, well, like why choose you over the other guys? That's a whole other another th deal. So that's the qualitative bit. And qualitative, I'll tell you, is, you know, it's the most enlightening part of it. The, the rest of it, uh, qu quantitative research is, you know, digital analytics stuff. It's uh, the funnel drop-off, segmentation. And, and another, another thing that I don't see people typically do is finding correlations between user uh, behaviors on your website and then uh, signing up. So for instance, uh, let's say that you have, a, I don't know, a pricing calculator on a website, some widget that people can interact with. So if they come to your website, interact with that widget, are they now more likely to sign up, less likely to sign up, or no difference? And so in Google Analytics, uh, granted that you're firing an event that somebody, when somebody interacts with that, you know, using Google Tag Manager or whatever. So if, if you can measure that, so, and let's say you see, oh, people who interact with this widget now convert 20% better. Now the question is, well, we don't know if it's the widget or the people who were more likely to sign up were just also more likely to interact with that widget because it was more relevant for them, whatever. Yep. So you need to devise an A-B test. So how can we get more people to interact with that widget? So if we can increase it from 20%, uh, or let's say that only 10% of your traffic did that. Can we increase it to 20% of the traffic? and see if the, the uplift, the 20% improvement in conversion rate still stands. Oh, so how do we do that? So of course, you know, we don't know what we'll, how to get more people to use, uh, interact with it. So we'll you know, come up with a couple of hypotheses. Typically, if you want more attention to something, it's all about real estate, making it bigger, more prominent, above the fold, on your highest traffic page. So you put uh, the interactive widget on your homepage, above the fold, you know, start there kind of like uh, insurance, you, you want to look at insurance companies, like their landing pages, like if you search for life insurance quotes or so on, those clicks on AdWords, they're like 50 bucks a click. Mm -hmm. So of course the lifetime value is like insane uh, on the back end. 
but you want to look at the funnel that they throw you in. You know, it's all about interactive widgets, man. So it seems like this is like 80% research. And it totally is. Hugely front loaded with let's dig in and do the research. And then a little bit of, hey, let's, you know, here's how you set up the test. Here's how you set up the analytics. Here's the actual like it is. It is totally because, I mean, setting up tests is not hard. I mean, assuming you have a front end developer available. I mean, some, some people think that they can set up A-B tests using the visual editors of all those testing tools. No, 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 that's for children. That's Why? That's, I Wait, mean, because, uh, well, I mean, what happens if you, if, well, you can use it to test copy. It's easy to make changes, but like if you make small changes, you also get small uplifts unless, you know, I mean, I mean, with copy, you could potentially get big uplifts too, depending on how horrible it was before. Yep. But also what happens is like, if you start messing with the page, make bigger changes with the visual editor, it auto generates the front end code, the, the jQuery code, and usually it's like such a horrible code that it will break the website uh, in like half the browsers, and mm. the, you know half of your functionality stops working, and so it's a Q, you know, huge QA problem. So do you guys use those, or do you generally just have a front end developer hard coded in? All with hundred percent developers. I mean, any testing tool also has a as a code editor, yeah. or at least an API you can use to deploy your code. So there's Nobody can do A-B testing without a front-end developer. Otherwise, you're just, you know, playing with a toy. It's not real A-B testing. Uh, so A-B testing is, th these days, it's not hard. Uh, great tools are available. Google Optimize is free, the, the, the initial version. So if you're just dipping your toes in, there's no excuse. The tools are not expensive. Also, like, low-cost tools are, that are pretty good are plenty available. Yep. But, like, what to test? is the hard part, and that is all about research. Usually, uh, when we do conversion research, you know, it takes us, you know, depending on how, how large the website is, uh, two to four weeks of uh, somebody doing it, and then we end up with, uh, you know, at least 100 issues, 100 problems that we have identified. Some of those uh, severe, some of those minor usability issues. And so then you start fixing them. Some of those are like no-brainer issues like, Oh, people can't read your uh, text on your website because the font size is too small. Well, that's easy. Just increase the font size. No testing needed. Or something is buggy or people don't know how to go there, like some obvious fixes. But for many things, uh, like let's say like we want to increase the number of people interacting with uh, something or going to a certain page. There's no way to know what's the best way to accomplish that. So we need to generate ideas. And so, so there we need to, uh, you know, develop a bunch of, uh, you know, test ideas. Like we talk through in a team setting, all the possible and radically different ways of doing it. Uh, and then, of course, we need some some kind of a prioritization methodology to prioritize those various test ideas, and you know, go with our best one to test. Of course, if you're a huge company, you can test multiple variants at once. If you're a smaller company, you probably can just do a regular old A-B test. Uh, and uh, you need to know your basic A-B testing statistics, you know, because people think that once you reach 95% statistical significance, test is done, but that's not a stopping rule. And it, people even don't know what statistical significance you means. Sample size, and you gotta you let to, it run at exactly. least a week. Or, or probably more, yeah. unless, I mean, if you're a very high traffic website, week might be enough. But yes, you, you start with your sample size calculations, plenty of calculators online available. And then, so let's say the calculator tells you that you need, you know, 10,000 users per variation based on the lift, uplift you want to be able to detect. And you have Amazon style traffic, so you reach that in five minutes, that sample size. Is the test done? Well, no, because what, what you did was you took a convenient sample, not a representative traffic. Because how traffic behaves uh, on Mondays is different from how it behaves on Fridays, how it behaves on Valentine's Day. Uh, even like hours of the day are different. Uh, also, like on this particular time when you run your test or like today, your competitor might be having a huge sale uh, that's like affecting your test. So there are all these externalities that might be influencing your, your, your uh, test here. So hence, you want to run the test, I say, minimum two weeks to uh, make sure that uh, you know, it's not just about, uh, I mean, that, so that it's rep representative of who comes, different traffic sources, 
different days of the week, all that stuff. And then finally, you look at the, the, the significance, because you can achieve significance with a tiny sample size, you know, seven conversions versus 16 conversions. Uh, but like, it's actually the margin of error and the statistical power on that is going to be you know, terrible. I feel like one challenge I run into and think about is, you know, on one hand, I'd love to run these perfect tests, you know, all the way to 99% significance and just like know for a fact. On the other hand, I'm running a business. You know, I'm trying to get some wins. I'm trying to, you know, move quick and iterate quick. I guess, how do you, how do you think about that dichotomy? Totally. So I think it, it really depends on what you're testing and the importance of that outcome on your business strategy. So if uh, you're banking all your strategies on the outcome of an A-B test, you want to be real sure that this is a legit outcome. So for instance, if it's like, hey, maybe we should change our target market, or maybe we should go after these other guys. So let's, let's split test our messaging and say uh, version A is small guys, version B is big guys. And it's, oh, big guys, wow, that's converts way better. They want to buy, changing pivoting, new target audience. And actually you had like a, a shitty test. Mm -hmm. Your, uh, the data was incorrect. And now you, you know, basically you're ruining it, ruining your uh, future yep. doing that. But if it's like you're testing messaging on a button, uh, sign up now versus get instant access, probably doesn't matter that much. It's okay if there's a 10% chance it's an invalid test and you can go you, back. You know, yeah. You're going to have false positive as well as false negatives. Uh, that's a given. Mm -hmm. uh, so if it's, if it's not a big deal, you know, that's fine. I also recommend that people actually use um, Bayesian statistics uh, rather than frequentist, which is the default. Uh, Bayesian statistics doesn't have p-values. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the reason I'm saying it's not that frequentist is in any way superior. And, you know, if you have any statisticians listening in, they're going to murder me here. <laughs> uh, but basically, the, the reason why I would endorse that people uh, use a, an A-B testing tool that uses uh, Bayesian stats, like VWO, for instance, is because it's easier to understand what the results mean. So if you have 95% statistical significance, which is the regular frequentist stats, it doesn't mean that it's 95% probability that B was better than A. Nor does it tell you about the, the risk of making a mistake. So all what statistical significance of p-value shows you is what are the odds uh, that we're seeing the result or more extreme assuming that A and B are actually identical. So it's a concept that's very hard to wrap your mind around. Whereas in Bayesian statistics, if it's, uh, it, it's, it's dealing with actual probabilities. It's, oh, we think that based on the, you know, the test uh, here, it's, there's 80% probability that B is better than A. And if you, would, if you could take 80% probability to Vegas, yep. you'd take that any day. So stopping tests at 80% probability is a risk that I, as a business owner, I'm ready to take any day mm. when I'm testing button copy or like, yeah. No, when I'm testing my business future, you know, type of test, of course, I want to be more sure. Yeah. And so like 95% significance, if their sample size is saying 19 out of 20 times you run this thing, we think you're going to get this result. Is that right? uh, not quite, uh, but that's for another uh, day. A deeper dive. Yeah. Perfect. Um, one other question I had, something we wrestle with is, if you just have two tests running, you know, A and B, is there ever a time to I mean, not two be fifty percent? Yeah, two, sorry, two variants. Is there ever a time to not have it split 50-50? Totally. Think about that. So um, I do endorse uh, bandit testing. So bandit testing is the the traffic allocation to a variant uh, changes dynamically. As B starts converting better, more traffic flows to B, and then when A is converting better, more traffic flows to A. So this is the type of test you want to run during a promo campaign. It's Christmas, it's you know whatever, uh, Black Friday, and Black Friday is just one day. So a bunch of traffic coming in, you have a sale, but you don't know which version of your website will sell better. So you put it, you use bandit testing, and it will automatically 
maximize the amount of revenue you make per minute, uh, so to speak. And if, if, you, if it's 50-50 split and, uh, and B was like 30% worse, oh man, half of yeah. the traffic, you know, we lost so much money. So, so bandit testing, perfect for that uh, allocation. Also, a bandit is great for if you're dealing with uh, personalization and this is machine learning based personalization, meaning that in an old school way of doing personalization in a website is like, if a user comes from Facebook, say, oh, hello, Facebook visitor, something, something, uh, you know, manual rules, if yep. then rules, whereas how you should do it today is all that uh, the machine uh, learning algorithm detects, you know, we know something about the user when they come in based on their IP at, oh, this is somebody from Idaho or something. Maybe they log in, now we know they're a 26 year old male, they've bought this and this in the past. Uh, maybe there's some other stuff that we know through, like we enrich the email with Clearbit, we know that there are the vice president of marketing from a SaaS company doing 50 million a year. You know, we can know all these vari variants and personalize the website accordingly. Now, uh, and maybe we have seven variations and we don't know like what this guy will, which version will work best for this guy. So now machine learning algorithm uh, starts uh, learning which of your many variations works better for this particular guy knowing what we know about this person. And again, start shifting traffic accordingly. So next time another person who is a similar person comes in, we immediately show them variation D because you know that tends to work better with this this type of people. So so again, that's bandit. And you couldn't do that with just rules based or a traditional. It's too complicated. I mean, you'd have to have full time person uh, manage this, and also the right answer might change. Yep. So like uh, the VP marketing type of people used to convert better for B, but now uh, six months later D is better. You know, so machine can learn that and, and adjust quickly. And there are multiple tools on the market that do this uh, automatically. Conductrix, Intellimize, and so on. Love it. Very cool. So to wrap up, I've got what I call the salty six. Six rapid fire questions for us to just get to know you better and uh, hear a little bit more about you. Does that sound good? Cool. All right. Salty six number one, outside of work and outside of A-B testing, what do you do for fun? Uh, I kickbox and I lift weights. Okay. Play with my kids. Yeah, very cool. All right. Uh, do you have a morning routine? And if so, what is it? My morning routine is I'll make, uh, I consume 30 grams of protein in a liquid form, uh, drink a cup of coffee and go to work. Out the door. All right. What time do you go to work? Uh, I get up at 6. I go to work at 6.30. All right. Uh, how do you focus during the day? You got a lot of stuff coming at you. Do you have any strategies for time boxing or whatever you do? How do you focus? Time boxing for the win, man. And I also try not to schedule meetings for every day. So I have two days in my week booked out in my uh, calendar so nobody can book a meeting with me so I can do deep work. Because, you know, if you know that you have a bunch of meetings coming up, uh, and you want to do some really intense work, you really can't get into it. So yeah, time boxing and not scheduling meetings for every day. Okay, what's a book that has impacted you deeply in the last few years? Oh my God, just now I finished a book that blew my mind. It's called The Road Less Stupid. Okay, uh, what is that? It's a guy actually here in Austin, uh, like an old dude, who's uh, experienced a lot of, um, like experienced business owner. And this is a book for business owners. Uh, you know, I'm a, I've always thought of myself as a conversion optimization consultant, expert, so on. So in the last couple of years, I've shifted my mindset to being a business owner. And now the skills that I'm now developing are all related to being a better business owner, better manager, and so on. So this book was like mind blowing. That's cool. I feel like I've seen that in your tweets over time. You know, it used mm. to be a lot more conversion and now it's just, you know, here's what I'm learning about business. Here's what I'm learning about teams and people. Totally. Very cool. Okay, what's the best purchase you've made recently under 150 bucks? Oh, um, one of those, uh, uh, what's it called? The device that you put on your back when you're slouching. I've seen that. Uh, up, upright. Okay. Yeah, those things really work. You wearing that now? No, uh, not right now, but uh, the, the hardest part is remembering to put it on. But once you put <laughs> it on, you realize how often you slouch. It's, it's not even funny. And have you seen other benefits from 
slouching less or just uh totally i mean that that and that's that's so important okay. i mean yeah very cool okay and then finally what's a trait or characteristic that you have that has led to the success that you have today i'm ridiculously proactive you know i take responsibility over everything uh so what can i do to improve the situation and also i'm super fast in terms of my mindset it's like oh there's a problem that i identified let's fix it right now so where some people might be like, oh, let's think about it, let's consult with somebody, let's meet, let's ponder. I'm like, fast action and taking, you know, taking responsibility. Default to action, let's solve this thing. Mm -hmm. You're married? I am. How does that work in marriage? Do you come in and just want to solve everything? Yeah, it drives my wife nuts. <laughs> I feel the same way. Well, there you have it, man. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for being on Scale or Die. If people want to find out more about you, about the Institute, I know you've got, you know, conference, you know, how do they look you up? ConversionExcel.com. And your Twitter. Yeah. It's pretty spicy, man. You've got some hot takes on there. Thank you. All right, man. Well, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you guys in the next episode.